Coronavirus. Overseas, across the nation, and here in Arizona, as the number of cases grow... This is an all-hands-on-deck effort. There's an escalating response. The solution is aggressive preparedness. Right now, we're cutting through the noise and focusing on the facts, answering your biggest questions about the coronavirus, putting information into perspective, and clearing up myths. 12 News presents Coronavirus. Facts, not fear. And this is how you know things are getting real. Costco has stopped giving out samples, and the prominent tech conference, South by Southwest, has been canceled by the city of Austin as of this afternoon. But life goes on. It's just that we're right now surrounded by information. It's sort of like being in a snow globe with the snow swirling all around you. It's been shaken up. Information is swirling around us all of the time. Some of it is true, but a lot of it is not. So when the story changes by the hour, by the minute, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? Well, we're here to try to help you cut through all of the noise that's out there. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Curtis. Welcome to 12 News Fact, Not Fear, when we talk about the coronavirus. We know that knowledge is power, and we're on a mission here at 12 to avoid sensational language and to try to put things in context, leaving you informed. So how did all of this begin with the coronavirus? How did the mania start? COVID-19, the official name of this newest coronavirus, first appeared in Wuhan, a city in China back in December of 2019. Within a month, the World Health Organization declared the outbreak a public health emergency, which we know sounds intimidating. We've gathered a team of experts tonight to help answer any questions that you might have. We want this to be an interactive show and for you to take part. And this is just the start of our conversation. We'll keep it going as long as it's needed in the coming weeks or even months. Let's begin with Team 12's Bram Resnick with new developments here in Arizona. Bram. Yeah, Mark, we're entering a new phase for coronavirus here in Arizona. The two patients diagnosed so far had traveled to high-risk areas. This latest patient, the third, had no contacts abroad, making it likely coronavirus has already spread in the larger community. And that could lead the governor to declare a public health emergency. Arizona's third coronavirus patient is a woman in her 40s who lives in Pinal County. She works at a health care job in Maricopa County. Health officials say she stayed home while she was sick and didn't expose many people. She was seriously ill but is now recovering at a hospital. This individual did not expose very many people at all because she was vigilant about staying home when she was sick. State and county public health officials say the new case is a sign of what's called community spread. The patient hasn't traveled to high-risk areas abroad or had contact with any travelers. As of now, public health officials don't know how she got sick. We have identified all close contacts and have let them know that they have been exposed and what they can do to prevent the spread and to monitor for symptoms. Close contacts typically would be asked to isolate themselves for 14 days. But as cases linked to community spread mushroom, health officials won't be able to keep track of all the people exposed to the illness. Once you have community spread, the isolation and the quarantine doesn't work as well. Arizona's top public health official, Dr. Kara Christ, says she's been in touch with Governor Doug Ducey about declaring a public health emergency. If this looks like it's, it's confirmed community spread, and we, that, that would be a tool that we could pull out. State law gives the governor the authority to coordinate a response that might include requiring people to work from home or canceling public events. If we're trying to make sure that everybody goes about their daily business and washes their hands, what message does the public health emergency signal? So we are weighing that right now. And public health officials declined to say where the latest patient works or whether she has school-aged children. The state reported today there are 15 test results pending on people who may have been infected by the coronavirus. Back over to you. Okay, Bram, thanks. As frightening as the constant updates of new cases can be, we want to bring you the facts, but also try to put some context into the numbers. First of all, when looking at the severity of the cases, health officials say most cases are mild. The World Health Organization surveyed 56,000 patients with this particular strain of coronavirus and found that 80% of the cases had only mild symptoms. The most important thing families can do? 
It's a lot of it's obvious. Practice good hygiene, and that means washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, not just rinsing them off. The World Health Organization recommends washing your hands after coughing or sneezing, when you're caring for someone who's sick, before, during, and after preparing food, before eating, after using the bathroom, when you have visibly dirty hands, and after handling animals or their waste. If you don't have soap available, they say use an alcohol-based sanitizer, but it has to be at least 60% alcohol. Now, we know a lot of you have questions about the coronavirus, and we're working every day here at 12 to bring you the confirmed facts without spreading any unnecessary fear. All you have to do to stay informed is text FACTS to 602-444-1212, and then all the latest information will be sent in a link to your phone. With allergy season fast approaching, we want to make sure that you know the difference in symptoms because some of them can be similar between allergies, coronavirus, and the flu. For coronavirus, you look for fever, cough, and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Symptoms can show up between two days and two weeks after exposure. Let's talk about the flu now. Fever and cough are also symptoms, but you'll also experience muscle aches, fatigue, and weakness, along with chills, sweats, congestion, and a sore throat. And if it's allergies, think about the typical symptoms. Sneezing, itchy eyes or nose, or maybe the back of your throat, a runny and stuffy nose, and watery, red, or swollen eyes. Well, right now, we're asking you to weigh in. Again, this show is for you to answer your questions. So if you have any questions about the coronavirus, we have a panel of experts standing by here in studio with us right now to answer your questions. Coming up, we're sitting down with those experts. We're going to look at social media and our phone apps to answer your questions about coronavirus. Also, sweet relief for a Valley family who found themselves stuck in quarantine after going on a cruise. Coronavirus can spread between people who were in close contact, about six feet from each other. This mainly happens through respiratory droplets that are produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes, very similar to the flu. Common symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. These symptoms typically appear in as few as two days or as long as two weeks after exposure. Well, welcome back to this 12 News special, and this is your part of the show. We're asking you to weigh in with your questions, whether it's on social media or texting us questions at 602-444-1212. We have a panel of experts in studio with us tonight who've been good enough to, to donate their time and come down here because this is something that we're all concerned about. The question is the level of concern that we should have, and we want to we wanna try to get everyone to just take a deep breath, and that's why we have our experts in studio. Joining us, uh, Dr. Kara Christ, the Arizona Department of Health Services Director, Dr. Frank Lavecchio here from Emergency Medicine, Valley Wise, Health, Valley Wise Health, and Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Kevin Steven. Good to see all of you. Thanks for coming in. And I wanted to mention that Rachel Cole is also standing by to answer uh, some of your questions on social media. Um, let's, let's begin with the level of freak out and how much it is warranted. Mm -hmm. The level of freak out is much more than the actual disease, right? And I think that's what's affecting all of us. As an emergency physician, I'm here as an emergency physician, a lot of people come in and say they want to be checked for it. Uh, you know, that's not realistic. Many times it's just like the common cold. What would you do for the common cold? We've been trying for years to figure out a cold, uh, a cold remedy, a good cold remedy. And coronavirus is similar to the cold in the great majority of people. All right, so if they're coming in presenting mm -hmm. with cold-like symptoms, maybe they're, they've got a runny nose, they've got a cough, uh, are we at the position now, and any of you can answer this, where you can, if you see that the, they're exhibiting or presenting with some symptoms, to test them for COVID-19? So right now, um, all COVID-19 testing in Arizona is being done at the Arizona State Public Health Laboratory. And so that requires a public health approval. But we're working with our diagnostic labs, such as LabCorp and Quest, to bring on those tests so that if someone presents at a healthcare provider, they can get tested. All right. So from an equipment standpoint, how, on a scale of 1 to 10, how up to speed is Arizona when it comes to having the number of tests and the, the number of people that we need should this become a, a serious problem here? So that is something that we're working on. Right now, we do have limited capacity for only those that are high risk with a history of travel or a history of contact. But we're hoping to get that up um, much quicker 
in the next few days. And, and how much of a concern is it now that we have a case of community spread? Uh, in public health, that heightens the concern. All right. You know, uh, Mark, I'd just like to take a step back and walk it back a little bit. Your first statement about you know, have the person that comes in with cold-like symptoms sure. to the ER urgent care, primary care office. I'd like to say, put the shout out there, please don't come in if you've just got cold-like symptoms. Because, yep. first of all, if you have coronavirus, you're going to spread it. If you have any other virus, you're going to spread but, it. But, but in all fairness, if, if I'm an elderly patient and I, I am seeing this stuff on TV, I'm reading about it on the Internet, I'm... I'm talking to my friends, maybe getting the truth, maybe getting some, some misinformation, and I have some underlying health condition where I've heard people have died from this, I want to get checked out. So sure, but those who are going to do poorly are going to have additional symptoms like fever and severe cough and shortness of breath. And so if it's the sniffles, and a runny nose, I just encourage people to just stay home and, and doctor themselves and, and don't even expose other people. All right, so then at what point do you say, ah, I've had this sniffles for three, four days, my temperature has gone from 98 to 100, is that the time when you go in and, and get checked out? You know, the great majority are older people and those with comorbidities. So for some unclear reason, young kids don't get it. Little kids don't get it, which I think is, you know, amazing. Thank God. Yeah, thank God. Is right. So I think if you're older and have some comorbidities, maybe you should get evaluated. Just realize that on our end, there's not much for us to do except supportive care. If you need help breathing, we give you oxygen and maybe put you on a, a respirator, but not much else. And when you get checked, I cannot tell you it just causes, you know, pandemics in our emergency department where you got to get checked. I got to put you in the side. No one wants to come near you. Everyone that goes in wants a gown before they see you. We have somebody come and test you and it's like four or five hours. And then the test comes back a few days later. So if you could avoid that and you, you look good and you could stay at home, you know, you're not really that far from an emergency department if you're young, relatively healthy. You know, you know what the problem is? WebMD. We all read it <laughs> and we all start thinking, okay, well, I can diagnose myself and this doesn't sound like a cold. This sounds like COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the ER and infect everyone. Hold that thought, guys. Let's go over to Rachel Cole and see what people are saying on social media. So you guys actually just answered one of the common questions coming into our newsroom from our viewers, which was, are kids more easily easily to come down with the virus? And just for the record, you guys did say no, they're not more susceptible. Is that accurate? You know, I think what we're seeing is that children can probably be reservoirs. I've seen case reports of children who are even asymptomatic and are shedding the virus, so they could spread it around the community, but it doesn't seem like they're going to get as ill with it as the older, mm -hmm. more vulnerable population. Yeah, I don't think there's been a death in a child yet, right, under right. five, which is pretty amazing. Certainly. So that was one from them. Another one that's really good ahead of spring break, especially um, coming from our viewers tonight. Is it safe to travel within the United States right now, such as New York City, for example? So travel within the state. Mm, good one. Yeah. We are not recommending right now that people change their travel plans domestically. If you are planning on going internationally, we would recommend that you check CDC.gov or the State Department for the travel advisories. Just make sure that you're washing your hands frequently, carrying hand sanitizer, and potentially wiping down areas before you touch. Them. I had a woman uh, text in and she said, I have a trip planned to Washington State. Should I go? Now, we know that that, that has been really hard hit. Yes. So Washington State has been hard hit. We still would say if you are healthy and you want to go, don't cancel your plans. Just make sure you're washing your hands a lot. Mm. Um, we've got another really good one. This was interesting as it was just a rumor uh, yesterday floating around uh, about Amazon packages or packages in general. Um, and this one coming from Franny and Parker about the coronavirus. If something is shipped from China to me or anyone here, what is the chance the coronavirus is on the package? Or what is what if it's shipped? Um, if the person has it. if mailing it has those Do symptoms, so kind of a, a a lengthy question, but a good one nonetheless from viewers. Uh, that's been going around for a while. Mm -hmm. So you know the the data that's out there shows that the virus uh, doesn't do well on surfaces like paper, cardboard, that kind of thing. It, it can live on hard surfaces, moist and and uh, you know uh, cooler surfaces, but you know heat and. Uh, drying out and, and those types of circumstances that you'd encounter with shipping internationally, uh, you know, it, it really isn't a concern. Do we know anything about the lifespan of the virus on a better surface like metal or a, a seat? It can be days to a couple of weeks probably, but you know, on a paper surface or cardboard, it's probably just an hour or two. Uh -huh. Because it's porous. Mm -hmm. and, and, and can you believe because of this hysteria that exists out there and, and, 
And let me just say, I don't think the internet has done any of us any favors because there's so much misinformation out there. Um, people are staying away from Chinese restaurants, which is kind of sad. That is silly. Um, the Amazon package thing is overblown, of course, and I think you should send all the packages to us and we'll, we'll take a look and see. <laughs> right. But I think practical things like wiping down surfaces are, are reasonable. I think we've been doing it forever in the hospital. At, you know, at, Clorox swabs or whatever. As, as physicians, we know that if you present with the flu, mm -hmm you can treat them with Tamiflu. Mm -hmm. Is there something like Tamiflu that's in the pipeline that we can treat people with? You want There's to? a pipeline drug that's mm -hmm. being tested right now. One of the pharmaceutical companies uh, has it in uh, phase three clinical trials. It's being tested in the United States and in China, uh, small groups of patients, so it's not gonna be widely available because they have to show that it's uh, effective before they're gonna right. broaden the exposure and, and give it to more people. What, how, how close are we, because there was talk today with community spread that the governor might declare a public health emergency? So that is certainly something that we are looking at. It opens up a broad range of authorities that public health and the state um, can access then. So we're looking at it. Um, depends on what kind of data we get potentially over the weekend and into next week. If we get community spread in multiple communities or it spreads beyond this, then we may consider a public health and, emergency. And what does that look like? So what that would look like, we would issue a declaration, or the governor would issue a declaration, and that would allow us to get, to do things with employees, to get access through procurement to certain equipment faster, as well as give us access to public health funding. So if we see this happen, it doesn't necessarily mean that the sky is falling. It means that Arizona will now get more funding and more resources to deal with this. Absolutely. It is an increase in resources and the ability to move faster. All right. Um, look, we, we invited you all down and we said, come up with something that you want the viewers to walk away with from the experts that maybe haven't seen their doctors, but they've heard a lot of things. What would you say? I would say wash your hands. Very important. Okay. I would say we've had lots of viruses in the history of mankind. This is somewhat similar. In a couple of years, we'll probably have a vaccine, probably like two years. If this goes slowly, you know, five, 10 percent new cases a year, we'll be OK. You know, and the problem comes when you get hundreds and hundreds of thousands coming into the emergency department and they all need respirators. We'll run out of respirators, et cetera, and hospital beds. <clears throat> so I think that's where the problem arises. You know, there's no way we're going to control it. It's out there. Right. You know, there's more cases out there than we're finding right now mm -hmm. because we haven't checked everyone. We don't know the denominator, the total number of people that have it. What we have to do is, instead of going like this with the cases, maybe go gradually like this, then we'll get a vaccine, and then maybe 50% of us will have it, the kids will have it, and you know, we'll get this immunity from it in a couple of years. Dr. Chris? So what I would say is this is spread very similarly to flu. So the prevention messaging is the same. So wash your hands frequently, cover your cough, stay home when you're sick, and avoid being around sick, uh, sick people. Try to stay about six feet away. All right, finally. And, you know, really the whole idea that respiratory uh, viruses are always going to be with us, um, this is the latest flavor. Uh, it is a, probably a bit more severe than influenza, but I really want to heighten the viewer's awareness of the fact that you just have to take these precautions every year, protect yourself. Uh, the panic is not warranted. Really, what we have here is another respiratory virus, and we just need to deal with it as such. I, I honestly, I don't sense any panic, any deep uh, rooted concern on any of your parts, which is good, and I hope that our viewers are picking up on that. Look, uh, stick around for the after show. Uh, we're going to be answering more questions uh, from our viewers, so, so keep sending them in, and we will try to get as many answered as we can. Still ahead, after more than a month, a Valley family is really, really happy to be back in the Valley. Their vacation started with a cruise, but ended with them stuck in quarantine due to coronavirus. Welcome back to our special. It's been almost two months since the Dixon family left Glendale. Their plans were to be gone for a nice two week cruise vacation, but an outbreak of coronavirus on the ship left them stranded and then quarantined. And now 50 days later, they're finally back at home. Barks of joy <laughs> and tears of relief filled the Dixon home as they greet their pets and return from what was supposed to be a nice two week vacation but turned into a 50-day ordeal. We didn't know how we were going to feel when we came home. It's been, it's, 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 you don't even know how it's impacted. You just kind of got through it.
The family was on the Princess cruise ship near Japan when the coronavirus outbreak occurred. They were eventually quarantined. Then they remained in quarantine at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio until Tuesday morning. Even being free last night on the way home, I would have bouts of tears, just, and I don't even know why. The family still trying to make sense of the 50 plus days that they were away from home. I, I, don't, I don't think we processed. No, I think we've ignored it. After all the stress and days of confusion, it's everybody was, you know, kind of yelling at the, at the marshals. And the Dixon family holds no grudge. We, we did what we were told to do, and of all the bad publicity that the, the virus has gotten and all of the unknown about it, they, the government needs to protect the American public from, from the unknown. Coming up, some final words on fear and the responsibility of journalists. Before we leave you tonight, a few words about fear. Fear is a raw emotion born from the womb of the unknown. It's the fire oftentimes stoked by rumor and gossip. And in the case of the coronavirus, it's fear driven by thousands of sources of information that in many cases are just plain wrong. But how do you know when it comes to this scary virus that has killed people, what's real and what isn't? Well, hopefully that's where we come in. Our hope here at 12 News is that if you're watching us right now, you've made a decision that in a world of information and disinformation that's constantly bombarding you, that you've grown to trust us, trust that we won't engage in fear mongering, and we'll only report the facts that we have taken the time to verify before we go on the air with them. When we act on fear, we tend to overreact, raiding shelves at Costco for toilet paper and hand sanitizer. We snap up all the masks that we can find, depriving health officials of what they really need. We're supposed to be the people you trust when there's a situation like this, and we don't take that responsibility lightly. Our job, especially when you have, it could become or not become a national crisis, is to make sure we're delivering the facts. So we thank you. Wash your hands, take a breath, and we'll get through this together. We owe it to our viewers that maybe can't get to a health professional, and, and you're here to, to really hope, helpfully, help calm some of these people. Uh, Mary in Maricopa says, I have COPD and have had lung cancer with two thirds of my right lung removed. How do I and others with compromised lungs protect against the virus? The, going back to the basics again, Mary, uh, it would be best to avoid people who are sick around you. Uh, protect yourself, we call it cough hygiene. You know, kind of like, and also uh, wash your hands frequently. And if the uh, uh, uptick in cases continues, I would really encourage anybody with the health problems she just described to stay home as much as possible. Really try to avoid going out for, especially for unnecessary errands, avoid large crowds. Uh, you know, just really try to, even large family gatherings, just try to be uh, very careful because she's very vulnerable. Dr. Christ, earlier today we saw the South by Southwest Festival canceled in Austin, which is an extremely popular event. That was obviously done out of an abundance of precaution because you don't want to mix with large, crowd, large crowds. Could we be looking down the road if cases continue to develop in Arizona at a situation like that where large gatherings, people going to spring training games and things like that or uh, going to concerts would be recommended? So at this time, we are not recommending canceling any mass gatherings. If you've got travel planned and are healthy, keep your travel plans. That is a tool in the toolbox if it does become very large or we feel we need to social distance people to, to break transmission, but right now we're not recommending that. We had our third case uh, confirmed today in Maricopa County. With all of your expertise, is this in Maricopa County and in the state of Arizona going to mimic other states? In other words, it is likely to get better, get worse before it gets better? We do anticipate to see more cases and more community spread in Arizona as we're watching what is going on in other states. So our main priority is to mitigate or lessen the risk for our communities, protect our vulnerable patients, and protect our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Now we talk about vulnerable patients, and I'm glad you said that because a lot of people hear that, but they're not quite sure what that means. How would you, as a physician, define vulnerable patient? Um, the virus seems to do worse in people that are older. Most of the mortality, most people that died are older folks, and most of them have comorbidities or things such as respiratory illness like we heard earlier, mm -hmm. COPD or asthma. 
or that sort of thing. So as you get older, the chances are more likely. And unfortunately, older in this case starts over 50, but over 80, much, much, much more so. I wanted to go back to canceling things. I think it's not that easy to get. You have to be in close proximity with somebody, you know, within six feet or so for the CDC says five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's quite a long time, you know. And unless somebody coughs on you, I think you're, we're pretty safe, you know. We, we hear about always immune suppressed people. How would you define that and, and what would you advise to anyone who's immune suppressed? Well, there's a whole um, uh, spectrum of people who have different problems with their immune system from somewhat mild problems. You know, we all get a little bit run down from time to time all the way to as you get older, predictably you're gonna get more run down and not be able to fight things as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether you use the f over 50, over 60, as I get older, I tend to keep to moving it up. I, I'm, up I'm pushing that boulder yeah, too. A lot Believe of people me. will say over 60, be uh, really sure. be careful with it because right. your immune system's not gonna deal with it as well. And, and you know, if it might be just slightly worse than the flu in the young population, it's, it's quite a bit worse uh, than, than most respiratory infections when you get the, the ones that have done poorly in China, for instance, were tended to be elderly and have health mm -hmm. problems. The ones that did poorly in Washington State, uh, nursing home, long-term care facility residents that were older with health problems. So, I mean, really, you know, the, the young, healthy, robust people don't have nearly as much to fear. A lot of people are pointing the finger at China and saying there was a lack of transparency when the Wuhan virus first appeared and we didn't find out about it until it was too late. Um, could we, as a country, have done more or was it inevitable that it would eventually make its way here? I, I think as we're learning more about this virus and learning that it's spread like influenza, that is a very difficult disease to contain. People get mild cases of it, they're out in the community, they don't know that they have something serious. Um, and so it, it, it can be transmitted a lot easier than someone who's going to be acutely ill and you're gonna identify them and be able to isolate them and contain that disease. For all of us that live in Arizona, there, there's this old, and I don't know if it's a myth or not, but there's this old belief that almost everyone, if you live here long enough, will get valley fever. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you walk around with valley fever, you don't really present any symptoms, and it, it goes away and it's not a serious problem. With other people, we know it becomes a very serious problem. Is this similar in that you could have COVID-19, have an, a runny nose, maybe not present with any other symptoms and it runs its course and it's gone and you never know that you had it? So what we are seeing is a very wide range of symptoms when we look at the study that was just published by China. So the, the majority of the cases that are seen are mild. So likely you feel like you've got the common cold, you feel maybe a little bit run down, runny nose, cough, but still well enough to potentially go out. About 19% have either a moderate or severe case of that disease. One of the things that we hear a lot is, well, I have Tamiflu, I never used it, can I take that? No uh, evidence at this point that uh, Oseltamivir or Tamiflu has uh, antiviral activity against COVID-19, unfortunately. Could it hurt you if you took it? You know, there's always side effects with any medication, a little bit of nausea, some neuropsychiatric stuff, but... So what would you we say to the people it? out there that have Tamiflu? Save it for when you have influenza A, okay. because uh, you, you're more likely to get resistance to influenza A if you keep taking those medications. L let's talk about the, the panic buying that's been going on. We've, we've seen people raiding the shelves of hand sanitizer and ridiculous prices online mm -hmm. for basic Purell. Mm -hmm. We've seen a run of uh, supposedly, if you go to some Costco's in town, you can't find toilet paper, you can't find uh, disposable gloves, you can't find uh, the, the sanitary, the hand wipes, the antibacterial hand wipes. How do you prepare but not get caught up in this buying frenzy and we haven't even gotten to stocking up on food? <laughs> you know, human behavior is, is, uh, is such that when we perceive that we're under threat, you know, we're going to take protective measures. We're going to want to protect our families, the people we right. care about. So that's human nature. But, I mean, counterbalancing that with, you know, the idea that, you know, you can all, even though if you're washing your hands frequently, you're not going to go through gallons of Purell. Uh, soap and water works as well, if not better. And so, you know, the, the whole idea is if you've got a bar of soap around, you don't need to go to the Costco and buy gallons of Purell. Right. Um, and really, you know, the bottom line is, I think just common sense needs to prevail. Well, that's easier said than done though, because we, we have seen these incredible runs on supplies that you would never buy, right? 
We aren't recommending to stock up right now on, on those types of supplies. If you think that you might come into contact or even potentially influenza, things that are important like medications, it's always good to make sure that if you needed to stay home for two weeks, that you've got a supply for that. But beyond that right now, I, I'm not changing my buying habits. Let, let's talk about the mask thing for a second, mm -hmm. because a lot. I think there maybe is some misinformation about sure. masks. Would I be right in saying that the masks that are, are generally available to the public really aren't gonna keep the COVID-19 virus out. It's, it's more for the person who is sick mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. keep from spreading that's right. the virus? It that's stops you from coughing. And that's exactly right. We, you know, in, our, in our clinic, we actually said we're going to have a, a box of masks, not multiple boxes, uh, so that if somebody comes in with a fever and a cough, mm -hmm. we can protect the others in the waiting room, you know, put a mask on until we have a chance to figure out what's going on with them. So it's but, to you know, keep healthy people if you're if you're if you're sick, if if you're sick, wear the mask. Mm -hmm. If you're healthy, wearing the mask probably isn't going to help you. That's correct. No, yeah, that's correct. All right, we have a question here. This is from Renee. She says, and and it's a good question. She says, should we keep current follow-up doctor appointments if we have compromised immune deficiency illnesses like fibromyalgia? That would be a really good thing to talk to your health care provider about. And so expressing those concerns, I would keep those, especially if you have an underlying medical condition, because you want to keep that under control. But um, if you have concerns talking to your physician about maybe scheduling first morning appointments when there's not a lot of other people there, um, a lot of times they can address your concerns. But. And I would just say, too, I, without hopefully coming across as self-serving, a part of my practice is telemedicine. And so I think that's a good venue to look at safety when it comes to not exposing large groups of people is if you have symptoms and you want to talk to an expert, a health prov professional, you can do it via telehealth. Uh, that's becoming easier to do with uh, access to the internet and uh, various vendors that are offering that as a service. You know, you just can, in the safety of your own home, not even go out and about and, and, and get answers. Okay, Cindy says, my daughter will be flying home from Phoenix from Spain next week. She's a healthcare provider. Her employer is requiring a 21 day quarantine. Is getting tested an option and how would she go about getting one in Maricopa County? You can get tested in Maricopa County. Um, I, I know you said testing's gonna be available hopefully next week. Yeah, okay, I think uh, 21 days seems a little excessive. Most people have symptoms, usually have symptoms within mm -hmm. five days. And you know, we, we recommend 12 days. And I think that's going away for healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. I think the CDC made an announcement today that if you're a healthcare provider and got exposed, you know, as long as you're well, you don't have to isolate yourself. You don't have to quarantine yourself. And I think that's a new change that came about. So maybe we could talk to the employer for her. All right, uh, Teresa from Glendale says, can someone infect or spread COVID-19 to others without any symptoms? Yes. There is shedding that occurs asymptomatically, and that's going to make this down the road a little bit harder to control than we initially thought. But, you know, it is one of those things that we experience with other respiratory infections. Influenza every mm -hmm. year, children are a, are, are a repository for the virus, even into the elderly and into nursing care facilities. And so that's why we try to get mass uh, immunization going, because we really want to have what we call herd immunity, where we're protecting everybody, including the most vulnerable. Uh, and so children can be asymptomatic shedders and can spread it that way. Which, which makes it a little more frightening because you, you're asymptomatic and you don't really know, so you unwittingly spread it. Uh, okay, this is from a viewer in Litchfield Park. Uh, Patrick, he says, thank you for uh, doing this and bringing the experts on. Uh, in 2009, H1N1 affected 61 million people in the U.S. and killed over 50 560,000 people worldwide and almost 13,000 in the U.S. Why didn't we see that kind of panic then? I think because this is a brand new virus that people mm -hmm. haven't heard about. Um, as a public health professional, I, I worry every year when influenza comes in because I know how unpredictable it can be. Um, but it's at least a familiar term and people are used to seeing flu every year. Right. So when, when you hear something like coronavirus or COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, it is the unknown. And, mm -hmm. and as we said earlier, the fear of the unknown is, is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. I think that, too, society has changed, too, compared to 2009 even. I think everybody's mm -hmm. hyper-connected. They're, mm -hmm. they're on the Internet. They're on social media. Uh, that was happening back in 2009, but it, much more so. It's, I think it's just magnified the, mm -hmm. the fear. I, I, I agree with that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyone else, Casey, uh, that you're, you're seeing on, on social media?
Well, that's, yeah. So we, we do have quite a few uh, uh, people watching us, which is good. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of, oh that, okay. Uh, we're getting a question, how do you protect yourself on a plane? And a lot of us don't have a choice. We have to fly for our jobs. Um, you know, the, there, there's advice out there that includes, besides don't sit next to the person who's well. And if you <laughs> if you get, find yourself seated next to somebody who's coughing a, a, a violently, you know, if there's room on the plane, you can ask to be reseated. I think that's your right, especially in this era of COVID-19. Um, otherwise, you know, common use surfaces. Wash your hands after you touch them, and, and before you touch your eyes or your mouth or anything. Cover your cough, you know, with your sleeve, not your hand. Uh, if you do cover, you know, contaminate your hands, go wash them again. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with the small restrooms that are on the planes. You know, be careful when you use them. Oh, those, and yeah. Up afterward. I mean, those are just gross. <laughs> Petri dishes, right? You know, I mean, maybe you just carry your own little Purell pack in your bag and don't bother with <laughs> touching the sink if you can avoid it. Yeah, and make sure you stay well hydrated and rest and, you know, low stress and everything you can try to do because travel is a tiring and it's stressful and you're going to get run down just from those aspects. And then if you th throw a virus exposure into the mix, you're what, more likely to get sick. Maybe may a dumb question, but what about things like emergency, the, the supplement that you can pour in water or taking extra vitamins? Is there any evidence that, that building up your immune system uh, and taking extra vitamins or taking things like emergency or some sort of an herb would be helpful or beneficial? Um, it appears it's probably useless. Okay. I think it's a I wish, I wish there was something that yeah. easy to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Because during the flu season, they, you know, I mean, they say that you, you really have to watch your immune system because if you allow your, I mean, aside from, aside from getting the flu vaccine, you should do whatever you can to, to keep your immune system healthy. Mm -hmm. Daily rest and good, good diet and, you know, uh, you know, those kinds of things are going to reap dividends in terms of your ability to resist infections when you are exposed. And that's a good thing to do. We, we just got a, a question from Heidi. She says, how can school teachers protect themselves if kids come in and could be asymptomatic? Mm. Anyone? So you would want those um, school teachers to wash their hands frequently, teach the kids to wash their hands frequently, and it's a great time to remind children not to stick their hands in their mouths and their noses. And if they do, make them wash their hands right away. And then disinfecting surfaces that the kids may touch. So it's really just being on top of those types of hygiene. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Debbie and Mesa says, I just watched the special and found it not to be helpful. It didn't address the fact that for older people, this is a real issue. And I feel like you all are saying, just wash your hands and don't worry. No one, no one is saying that. No, it, it is a real issue for older people. But these viruses have been around and they're gonna be around again. There's gonna be a new virus in a couple of years. And it's probably gonna say more of the same thing. You know, caution, you know, wash your hands, keep away, go to the doctor if you're really, really sick. And, and older people die more. And largely, you know, the reason why we're hammering those points is those are the things we can do. Right. You know, we don't have treatment. We don't have vaccine yet. So you mm -hmm. have to do the public health things that you can do to protect yourself. But yes, um, just like more people die of influenza when they're older and have a weakened immune system with, with COVID-19, it's the same, going to be the same situation. So yes. we're not ignoring the older set that's at higher risk. We're just saying we, this is what we have available and that, that these are the tools in our toolkit. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and uh, you know, you have to find the sweet spot between you know, spreading fear, which we don't want to do, and minimizing something that could, for segments of the population, be very dangerous. And, and so a lot of it is common sense. As you said, wash your hands, don't touch your face, which I just did, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, there is a time when you should go to the doctor, but if possible, if I'm, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, stay away from the doctor's office if you can. Yes, especially the emergency department. <laughs> and, and regular appointments, if, if I'm, I'm going in for my yearly physical, it, would it be a good idea right now to, to push that off? If it's something that's non-urgent, you might want to push put it off just so you're not exposing yourself in a, in a w busy uh, waiting area where there could be people that are transmitting respiratory viruses, influenza and COVID-19. Right. You know, and, still... and, and let's say, and we didn't really touch on it, I mean, we just had our first uh, child death in Maricopa County from the flu. Mm. Today we've reported on that. So it's, it's still a very real mm -hmm. problem in Maricopa County and across the country. Millions of cases of flu as opposed to, you know, tens, hundreds, or thousands of COVID-19 in, in the United States. Yeah, in Arizona, we're almost at 28,000 influenza cases this year, and primarily in our kids. Yeah, and in a lot of cases, the flu has mutated. We mm -hmm. all got the, I got the shot. 
Mm -hmm. I know that there are a lot of people that don't like to get the shot, but if you got the <laughs> shot, there are still people getting the flu that got the shot because I guess because it wasn't the right strain and we didn't guess right. Yeah, it's hard to guess exactly right, but this year is about 50% effective. And it's hard to predict because things are happening in China and we try to predict what it's going to be here. Things happen in Australia, we try to predict what's going to happen a few months later and try to predict the right strain of influenza to put in that vaccine. And what we always hope is that people feel like they're a seatbelt. So even though they may not keep you from getting influenza, hopefully the it's less severe, it lasts much, it's much shorter, and you don't spread it as much. All right, and finally, gut check time. Are we going to all get through this okay? Absolutely. We'll be all right on the other yeah. end. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll come out of the rabbit hole. Hopefully, <laughs> please, uh, fine, do the right thing, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Thank you all for coming in tonight. Thank Stay you. safe out there, and we appreciate your watching uh, on 12 News and on all of our social media platforms. We'll see you back here at 10 o'clock.